debate. Intelligencesquared.com. Alain de Botton, please welcome him. He's a writer and philosopher. Alain, would you like to take to the podium? <laughs> writer, philosopher, and founder of the School of Life. Alain, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to propose something rather unusual, that we can raid religion as non-believers for the best bits of it. That's extremely impious if you happen to believe. The idea that religion is a buffet from which you can take the choicest cuts is deeply offensive to believers. But I want to argue that there should be nothing offensive about that approach if you're a non-believer. Imagine if, essentially, religions are treated as cultural works. Why not pick the best bits? Imagine you liked the essays of Virginia Woolf, and somebody came along and said, you can't just like the essays. You have to like the whole thing. You have to sign on the dotted line and commit your life to Virginia Woolf. This would seem absurd. In culture, we can pick and mix. We can like a bit of the essays of this person, the plays of that person, the early novels of the third, and that's allowed. And I want to suggest that we can do something similar with religion as non-believers because there are plenty of really good ideas within religion. And what I want to do now is just take you through one or two of the ideas that I think are the most tempting, most interesting within religion that appeal to me a complete non-believer. One of the ideas that I love Religions start off from the idea that all of us are close to breakdown. We are fragile, we are nervous, we are vulnerable creatures. And so what we need above all is guidance. We need what gets called pejoratively in the modern world self help. If you're a modern, intelligent, secular person and you say, I'm having a bit of a crisis and I've been reading some self-help books, people will think that you're an idiot. Um, they, you know, the assumption is that once you've reached uh, adult maturity, you are not in need of counsel so often. Even if you say, I'm in psychotherapy, people will say, oh, oh dear, what, you know, in what way are you crazy? Um, so the assumption is that fragility is, can be equated with, with a kind of madness. All religions, all major religions, rather touchingly, refer to their adherents as children. They see us, as modern psychoanalysis sees us, as essentially childlike inside, constantly prey to the same vulnerabilities as children, and hence in need of guidance. That's a very useful insight, and the starting point for the pedagogic efforts of religions. What religions want to do is to guide us towards goodness. Now, I don't necessarily agree with the vision of goodness that religions propose, but I love the idea of the attempt at education in the realm of the personal life. That's, in a sense, what I've dedicated my own life to, inspired by religion. So the content I don't necessarily agree with, but the form is fascinating. I also love the way that religions go about teaching us. One of the things that religions are really aware of is we're incredibly forgetful. You know, the secular world, the godless world, thinks if you put somebody in a classroom or a university and you pour in some knowledge, it'll stay there for the next 40 years throughout a career in management consultancy. You don't need to top it up. Religions are obsessed with the fact that our minds are like sieves. So if you tell somebody something at 9 a.m., they'll have forgotten it by lunchtime, and they'll need a repetition and then another one at dinner time. All the major religions are essentially constantly trying to repeat things, and the secular world forgets this. We always want the new rather than circling, as religions do, around the traditional. The other thing religions do wonderfully is arrange time. They create calendars, chronologies, so that we will regularly come into contact with some of the most important ideas. We believe in diaries in the secular world, but they're for scheduling things like tax returns, whereas what religions do is encounter spiritual uh, 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 meetings. So, you know, on the 31st of March, you will meet Saint Jerome, and you will be reminded of kindness and gentleness and lots of other things. So I love the idea of structure as it applies to the internal life, and that's something that religions do uh, wonderfully. The other thing that religions do, of course, perfectly is rituals. Now, what is a ritual? A ritual is an elevation of what in the secular world might be a merely private moment to a communal moment that has some rules and has a fixed place within a community. In other words, we don't forget it. We don't forget to do it. Take the moon. You know, the, um, it, we always look at the moon. Some of us look at the moon and we think, oh, isn't it lovely looking at the moon? It puts things in perspective. It, you know, adds a feeling of grandeur, etc. But we don't look at the moon enough. Now, if you're a Zen Buddhist, every September, that impulse, which in the secular world is rather vulnerable, gets raised into a ritual, the ritual of Tsukimi. You'll go out, you'll stand on a canonical platform, and you will reflect on the moon in a ritualized way. So that, that meeting is in your diary. Something wonderful, I think, about that. 
The other thing that religions do really well is to remember that oratory is incredibly important when you're trying to teach someone something. I'm making a bit of a hash of it, but if you go to a Pentecostalist church, say in the Southern American uh, states, um, you will see religious oratory at its peak. There's a constant uh, call and response. The preacher says something, the audience says, amen, 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 you know, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Savior, thank you, Christ, you know, that kind of thing. I think that uh, secular people should imbibe some of this, should copy it. You know, imagine if at university, rather than sort of sitting there with your arms folded, if the preacher or the lecturer were fired up with some of the energies of Pentecostalism, you'd go, you know, thank you, Jane Austen, thank you, Montaigne, thank you, Shakespeare, and you'd rouse up and you'd go, amen, amen, and, you know, that way the knowledge would stick. But no, we just stand there very politely. Um, Religions are interested in sermons, um, and the secular world's interested in lectures. What's the difference between a lecture and a sermon? Well, a sermon wants to change your life, whereas a lecture, well, just wants to impart a little bit of information. So again, we like that. The other thing religions remember is uh, you're dealing with, with people who are not just uh, uh, minds, they're also bodies. In other words, religions are constantly trying to touch us through mind and body. So wonderful rituals in Zen Buddhism, the Zen Buddhist tea ceremony. Now, you know, Zen Buddhism is always talking about the impermanence of life and, um, you know, the brevity of existence, etc. But it doesn't just do this through lectures. It gives us a cup of tea in a certain room, you sit in a certain way, and a philosophical lesson is bolstered by a physical action. And you get this in all religions, and it's tremendously uh, insightful uh, in terms of the way we work. The other thing religions do really well is use art. Um, uh, you know, sometimes people think, you know, what about humanism, etc. The thing about humanism is the art is so bad. Um, you know, if you've ever been to a humanist wedding, it just looks terrible. The great thing about religions is they had the phone numbers of the best artists. You know, where did the Catholic Church go? Titian, you know, Mantegna. They got the real guys. So, and the, because, the reason they did this is because they knew that you, in order to get to somebody, you need to touch them through the senses. They were also quite clear that art isn't just for art's sake or some mysterious nebulous thing. The purpose of art is quite simple. It's to keep you on the right track. It's to remind you of what's good and healthy and wise, and it's to frighten you from what's bad. That's a beautifully simple mission that I think all artists can respond to whatever the quality, whatever their, their type of work, uh, even uh, in, in the modern age. In a way, art was a form of propaganda. Titian was a propagandist, and that's normally frightening when it's Stalinist art, but when it's the art of Titian, we excuse it because it's propaganda in the name of goodness. Again, something to be uh, uh, inspired by. The other thing religions are really good at doing is cementing community. Now, all of us are normally quite bad at community. We sit there unless there's a good host in the room. Now, if there's a good host in the room, that host will say, look, everybody, everybody introduce yourselves, and suddenly everybody starts talking. I bet none of you have really talked to anyone you didn't know here. But if I, I'm, not, I'm not going to waste up my valuable time doing this, but if I said to you now, just talk to your neighbors right now, talk to a stranger, don't do it, but if, you, if I said that to you, suddenly the conversation would flow, and the sociability that's within all of you would have a chance to rise and express itself. All of us are far more social than the modern secular world allows us to be, but we're scared, we need a host. Now, religion is that host. Religion essentially brings us together in spaces and says, in this building, you can actually talk to someone without being thought a lunatic. And that's a very nice thing to do because so often our sociable impulses are, are, are stifled. The other thing religions do is realize that we need to change, we want to change, and they give us a mechanism for that called pilgrimage. Um, they, they send us on journeys and they use travel as a mechanism for an inner evolution as much as it is about traveling uh, through space. And again, think how shallow modern journeying is without the example of religion. So what I'm trying to do, rifling through this buffet in the, the nine minutes that have been allotted to me, um, what I'm really trying to do is to draw your attention to the way that religions, without God, without belief, are full of very valuable ideas that can be of use in all sorts sorts of areas in uh, secular life. Now, the religious will say, but without God, you know, uh, Canterbury Cathedral is nothing, or, you know, the, the, the music of Bach is nothing without God. And the, the, the unfortunate truth is, well, it's still pretty impressive. You know, I mean, I don't believe, but I find Bach's cantata still pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, Ely Cathedral does do it for me. So I, I can't speak for what the full effect of, of these secondary organizational aspects of religion might be. But what I, if, if I did believe, but as a non-believer, I can tell you that yes, these things do affect me and they do work. They may not have the full power, perhaps, but they have quite a lot of power. That pleasant chiming tells me that my time is up. Anyway, um, so really what, to conclude, 
religions are on the whole far too intelligent, wise, complex, and sophisticated to be abandoned only to those who happen to believe in them. Thank you very much. Alain, Alain, thank you very much, but please stay there, because at this point, the opponents of the motion have a chance to grill you for a couple of minutes on what you've just, what they've just heard. Yeah. Anne. Is this working? Yes? No. I, I, what I want to ask you, Alain, is um, what do you make of the person of Jesus? It was C.S. Lewis who pointed out that what you cannot do is call him a good man. He was either mad, he thought he was God, or he was bad, he was lying, he was wicked, or he was who he said he was. So who do you think he was? Well, I'm going to disagree with C.S. Lewis. I do think he was wise. I think he was slightly nutty. I mean, if one was a psychoanalyst, one would call him probably a borderline personality. He, was, he definitely had issues They're with mad, his... Basically. He definitely had issues with his parents. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but, but look, I think overall he had some wise things uh, to tell us the thing got out of hand. Um, you know, it was all a bit hot-headed. Um, so, uh, look, I'm being very, very impious, and I don't really want to be because the other thing about... No, I'm not asking you. Yeah. I don't mind you being impious. Yeah. I just want you to be logical. Yes. Rational. So, being logical, I think, as I say, he's a borderline personality, issues particularly with his father, and, uh, but, you know, some, some intelligent things to say on a lot of things. <laughs> Can I just ask your experience of what you call the religious hosts who cause conversation? As a man who attends quite a lot of religious ceremonies, or I have done in the past, the flow of conversation in most of the churches I've gone to has been absolutely appalling, if existent at all. And I have found that the secularity of wine and uh, sexual attraction is far more <laughs> powerful in... Uh, <laughs> Causing conversation. I mean, is your experience different from mine? Um, look, here again, <laughs> it's, it's the theory and the practice, um, you know, um, uh, as, as people with What do you mean a, the practice? Well, in other words, the theory, the theory of... Look, what I want to say is the possibility of a good encounter is sometimes enhanced by rules. What religions are quite good at doing is getting people in a room and saying, now this is going to happen. And that's very helpful. I mean, in medieval times, there was this wonderful feast called the Feast of Fools. And the point of the Feast of Fools was basically to say, now you can have an orgy. Now you can have sex with anyone you want. Uh, just for a day, uh, but, you know, really let go. Uh, and that's terribly useful because most of us want to let go, but we don't know when, and it becomes messy, and we have affairs, and you know, it all becomes very perturbed. In the, in the normal Catholic uh, uh, ritual, in the medieval Catholic view, you have one day, um, which is you go crazy. And this is, you know, in Brazil, you still see echoes of this in, in carnival. Um, and then the rest of the time, order is imposed. I quite like this external support for internal needs so that you're not wholly responsible for your own impulses. The community takes them, structures them, and gets you in and out of the orgy. Terribly useful, because it's often so hard to know how to get in and how to get out. So it's very useful. Feast Order. of fools. Yeah. With that, with that bit of wisdom, Alain, I think uh, we should bring the Thank question to a stop.